Well, I am Ron Waterman, the youth pastor here. So glad you guys made it out this morning. Let me open up in prayer for us. Lord, thank you for every single person in this auditorium today that weathered the storm and made it out to service today. Thank you for those that are viewing this service online with us. Lord, we pray for your word that, would be, that it would be heard and that it would be applied to our lives. Lord, we give you all the honor, we give you all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. One day there was a, a wise Indian chief, and he sat down his young grandson, and he said, you know what, son? He said, there's a battle that goes on inside of each one of us. He said, we have a good wolf that lives in us, but we also have a bad wolf. And these two wolves, they don't like each other, and they're constantly fighting against each other. He said the good wolf is full of, the, the, excuse me, the, the bad wolf is full of anger and hate. It's selfish. It's filled with envy. But the good wolf, the good wolf is full of love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. It has self-control. And the good wolf, the good wolf has faith. Well, the young boy sat there and he thought for a minute. And he said, well, Grandpa, if these two wolves continue to fight against each other, which one of the two wolves wins? And the wise Indian chief looked back at his grandson. And he said, the wolf that wins is the wolf that you continue to feed. As I go into today's lesson on David and Goliath, it's one of the most well-known stories, the most well-known battles in all of Scripture. I want everyone to realize that there's a battle that goes on inside of each one of us. It's the epic story of good versus evil. What I like so much about the story of the good wolf and the bad wolf is it's actually right out of Scripture. It's right out of the book of uh, the Galatians. Galatians 5, 16 through 24. And I'm going to read the first and the last verse out of that. And it's just the spirit of the human nature. <clears throat> and in Galatians... Uh, 516, it says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then the last verse in that is Galatians 524, and it says, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You see, I think if I was to ask any of you, and after I finished telling that story, you would, of course, say, well, of course, I want to feed the good wolf. That's who I want to be. I want to, peace it up. I want to be a person that has love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. I want to have self-control. But I say that and I, just, I, I, just, I need to remind myself every single day when I wake up that I need to feed the good wolf. Because I can say that all I want until I'm driving to work and someone cuts me off. Or maybe you're at work, or you're at school, and you hear some gossip, and you're the center of that gossip, and then all of a sudden we get defensive, and of course we start to feed that bad wolf. I need to make a conscious effort every day that I wake up that I'm going to pick up my cross and that I'm going to feed the good wolf, and I need to remind myself that all day long. David and Goliath is a, a classic underdog story. Most of you have heard the story of young David. Those of you that were here uh, last week, you heard Pastor Kelly's story, and a lot of that I'm going to just recap today. He was the smallest of seven older brothers. He was kind of the, the runt of the family, the smallest, the youngest. And of course, it's David, the one that is selected to go on and, and face the giant Goliath. Now, many times when you hear the story, I mean, most of you have probably heard David and Goliath preached before from the stage. And a lot of times what happens is the preachers will talk about this story and they'll, they'll tie it into how you can deal with all of your fears. Sometimes the pastors will put you in the place of David. David the courageous, the fearless, the anointed one of God. And they'll tell you that to think about all the things in your life that you should be courageous with, that you should be fearless in facing and then they'll tell you how to conquer every single one of those things in your life. Sometimes, 
pastors will tell you to put yourself in the place of Goliath, who represents our fears. And they'll tell you how to banish your fears. Having so much confidence in your own abilities that there's no way that you can lose any battle. Well, let me recap this battle for us. The Philistines and the Israelites, they were always in battling each other. They were always fighting each other, battling each other. And it was usually over land. And they both had completely different worldviews. The Philistines served man-made deities. They were known as violent and warlike. So in this battle, the Philistines come to, to face the Israelites in battle, and they show up to the battleground, and instead of having a massive amount of bloodshed and hundreds and hundreds of soldiers dying on the battleground, the, the Philistines decide they just want to send out one man to face one man from the Israelite army, and the winner of that battle wins the war and save all this bloodshed. So of course, in the story, the Philistines send out the giant nine-foot Goliath. And, you know, in, in my career, I'm, I'm just trying to imagine a nine-foot giant. Um, I've had some pretty unique opportunities. Those of you that, that have heard a little bit about my past, I used to compete in the UFC, and I competed in the UFC before they had weight limits. So I fought a lot of 400-plus pound heavyweights in the octagon. And then when I went into the WWE, I'll never forget the very first time that I stood in the ring and had to face uh, the big show. Paul White was his name. He stood at uh, a little over seven foot tall, over 500 pounds. So as I'm looking at this guy, you know, and having to pick this guy up over my head, it was, it's a, just, I can't even fathom seeing someone that would be two feet taller than that, much heavier than that, the Bible tells us actually the armor that Goliath wore weighed over 150 pounds, which was probably more than David weighed, period. So it's hard to imagine seeing someone that, that was really that big. The story tells us in 1 Samuel 17, 16, for 40 days, the Philistine came forward, took his stand morning and evening. So what they did is the, they, would, they came up to the battleground and they sent Goliath out to the front and he would intimidate the Israeli army trying to find one person that would come out and face him. So for 40 days, of course, none of the, the Israelites were about to bite. They didn't have anybody that was brave enough to stand up and, and fight the giant Goliath. But one day, Jesse, if you remember the story from last week when uh, Kelly was telling us about Jesse and his brothers, um, Jesse, who was David's father, he sent David to actually go to the battlefield, not to fight, but he wanted to send him to the battlefield to give his, his brother some food. He brought some cheese and some bread for them on the battlefield. And then Jesse tells his son David, he says, and while you're there, bring something back to show me that, that my boys are okay. So David goes tromping out to the battlefield amongst a thousand soldiers and and sees him, and he, he hears the giant's big, deep voice. And um, so as he hears him, he, he stops and he thinks for a minute and, and listens to actually the words that, that Goliath is saying. And he turns to one of the other Israelites, and he says, why does he think that he can speak against the army of the living God? So during this time, David's brothers actually end up seeing David out on the battleground, and they, it says that they get mad at David, they think that he's just trying to, to get out of his chores for the day by watching the sheep and, and doing everything else. Maybe he's just being nosy out on the battleground. But those of you that remember last week when Kelly was talking about young David, he was actually anointed over all of his other brothers just shortly before that. So maybe they were a little bit jealous of David. So it could have been a couple of different things, but David doesn't get much respect. He's the, the smallest, he's the youngest, he's the weakest of all the brothers, yet David was the one that was anointed. In 1 Samuel 16, 13, it says his father didn't even present him to Samuel when he was sent by the Lord to anoint him. Jesse brought out all the other sons to stand in front of Samuel to see which one was um, gonna be anointed, 
except David. He left David out in the fields to tend to the sheep. Well, Samuel came into the room to look at all of these brothers because the Lord told him to anoint one of Jesse's kids. So when he goes in there, and of course, the very first one he sees is Eliab, the, the biggest, the strongest, the oldest one of Jesse's boys. And even Samuel himself said, surely this is the one that I'm supposed to anoint. But what's so cool is it tells us that the Lord immediately spoke to Samuel at that moment. Um, and I love what he says. He says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, he says people judge by what's on the outside, but the Lord looks at the heart. Aren't you guys glad that the, the Lord judges us by our heart and not by our appearance? The world tries to tell us all the time that we need to look a certain way to be liked, to be successful, to be confident, to have a victorious life. The enemy feeds off of this and he attempts to put into our mind all these deceptions. You understand the devil wouldn't be attacking you so hard if there wasn't something holy inside of you. Thieves don't break into empty homes. So Samuel uh, came to the house, ends up anointing David over all of the brothers. Um, those of you that have accepted Christ into your life need to understand that you have already been armed, you've already been given the ammunition to fight just as David did. When I talk to our youth um, about some of the common issues that they face every single day, like peer pressure, drugs, alcohol, fear of not being loved, abandonment, lust, sex, I reassure them that they've all been given the strength, they've all been given the ability to fight off those battles and those temptations. It reminds me of a, a school assembly I was doing with the strength team that I used to travel around. I still get to travel with them occasionally. But we were up, one of the other team members and I were standing in a, a high school assembly in California in front of about 2,000 high school kids. And my friend's name was, was Barry. He was a pretty big guy himself. He was about 6'5", 350 pounds. He was an amazing athlete. I think he played football and wrestled in college. And he was sharing a little bit about his own personal story with 2,000 high school kids one day in a gymnasium. And he was telling the kids that he went all the way through middle school, junior high, high school, college, and most of his young adult life. And he said, a drop of alcohol has never touched my lips. An illegal drug never entered my body. And Barry said, I'm 32 years old and I'm saving myself for that one special woman on the day that I get married. And right there on the front row of the, the bleachers, this young freshman girl pops her hand up into the air. She says, guess what, Barry? I'm a virgin too. Well, some of the kids a couple rows back, some of the senior girls immediately began to, to point their fingers, to tease and to joke this young girl, make fun of her. Well, this is the wrong girl to tease and make fun of. Immediately, she jumps up out of her seat right on the very front, walks out to the middle of the gym floor where Barry was standing, takes the microphone out of his hand. I think he was scared. <laughs> he didn't know what was about to happen, but she looks back at those senior girls and she says, you know what, you can laugh, you can make fun of me, you can tease, you can joke all you want. She says, I can be like you in 10 minutes, but you can never be like me again. She gave the mic back to Barry and she went back and sat down. And I thought, wow, this girl was pretty brave for standing up for her morals, her character, her beliefs, her standards, even if she had to stand alone that day in that gym and do that in front of all of her peers. You know, not all of us can be like my friend Barry. But we need to understand that we have been given that ability. When it comes to sex, many of us have failed to test whether it be purity, lust, pornography, adultery. I've got everybody's attention now. But if we think about the issues that our, our kids face, it's really not that much different than what all of us face. 
what tests that have been struggled with throughout of all of eternity and throughout time. You know, we all fear the loss of love. We fear the loss of wealth. We fear the loss of life. And all throughout scripture, we see the struggle with sexual impurity. The mighty David himself falls to infidelity and murder later on in his life. What's so cool, though, is yet God still calls David in 1 Samuel 13, 14, a man after his own heart. You see, God sees the true repentance of David, and he still calls him a man after his own heart. You know what? Sometimes we don't live up to what we know God wants for us. We fail. And when that happens, sometimes we feel defeated. We feel shame. And sometimes we beat ourselves up, and sometimes we beat ourselves up for years. How many of you can see what this is right here? It's a crisp $100 bill. How many people would want a crisp $100 bill? Raise your hands. Some of you don't want it. What if I was to take this $100 bill and I was to fold it in half, fold it in half again, fold it in half again, and now this $100 bill has a whole bunch of creases in it. It's not crisp anymore. Now who wants the $100 bill? About the same amount of hands went up. So now what if I take it, I unfold it. Now it's got all these creases in it. What if I take it and I just crumple it all up in my hands? Make it into a nice tight little ball. Now who wants the $100 bill? Everybody still wants it. What if I take it and spit on it, throw it down on the ground, stomp on it, get it dirty, it's stuck to my shoe. I beat on it a little bit. Now who wants it? Hands still went up. How many of you guys realize that God looks at us just like we're looking at this $100 bill today? The point is that we're all flawed. We're all a crumpled up mess. We all have imperfections. The point is no matter what anyone has said to us, has said about us, has done to us, or what has happened in the past, we still have great worth. We've never lost our value because we're all made in God's image. We're all of great worth, and that never changes. Crumpled up, beat up, spit on. Every single one of us has our own story, and we can all relate to this $100 bill. But even after it's gone through all of this, who still wants the $100 bill? <laughs> In the story of David versus Goliath, even Saul, even Saul was afraid of the giant. And you guys remember Kelly last week when she was talking about Saul? She said Saul was head and shoulders taller and bigger than all the other Israelites. And Saul was the, the head of the, arm, the Israeli army. But yet even Saul wasn't going to take, take on Goliath. He wasn't willing to, to sacrifice himself to go out and fight this giant. It says, when Saul heard, it says when David wanted to fight the giant, he went up to, to Saul and talked to him. In 1 Samuel 17, 33, and Saul answers, you can't fight that Philistine. You're not even a soldier. Goliath has been fighting in war since he was a boy. And David looks back at Saul and says, 
Well, what about the lion and the bear? I killed protecting my sheep. He says he'll kill Goliath just like he killed the bear. And he killed the lion. In 1 Samuel 17, 37, it says, The Lord saved me from the lion and the bear. He will also save me from this Philistine. Saul looks back at young David and he says, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Saul puts his armor on David, but obviously it's much too large for little David to wear, so it pretty much just falls off of him. And David heads out to the battleground. He was outnumbered, outarmed, outweighed. But he heads towards Goliath with a walking stick. And as he's heading towards the giant with a walking stick, he's looking for five stones that he can put into his shepherd's bag. And as he gets closer, he, the giant Goliath looks at David and it says he laughs with disgust. He yells out, what is that stick for? Did you come to chase me away like a dog? David looks back at the giant and replies in 1 Samuel 1745. It says, you come to me using a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, all-powerful, the God of armies of Israel. Today the Lord will let me defeat you. I will kill you. David takes off in a dead sprint towards the giant. He pulls out a stone from his bag. He puts it into a sling and he starts to swing the sling. A lot of scholars have said that actually when the stones come out of that sling, they come out at over 100 miles an hour. So he starts to, to swing his sling and the stone comes out, hits Goliath right between the eyes. It says it sinks deep and the giant fell to the ground face down. So David wins the battle, but he wins it not because he believed in his own abilities. It's because he knew that he had the Lord on his side. Goliath, when he went into battle, he went overconfident. He went in with no fear. And he went in unguarded. You know, I believe that a true champion sometimes feels fear. It's okay to feel fear sometimes. When Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane, he knew what was about to happen to him. I believe even Jesus felt fear. The word says, his body sweat great drops of blood. When we think about putting ourselves into the story of David and Goliath, I think it's more ap uh, appropriate to put ourselves into the story as the scared Israelites, knowing that we're helpless without God's intervention. There was a, a lady named Edith Evans, and Edith Evans was one of four survivors, first-class survivors, or excuse me, four of, one of four first-class passengers on the Titanic that ended up dying. You see, if you remember the movie, The, Tit the Titanic, the, perp the people in first class were the ones that they ended up giving the life, the, the vest to, and the boats to escape the Titanic when it was drowning, when it was uh, going down. So Edith Evan is going to uh, jump on one of these life boats, but right before she got onto the boat, she noticed a young woman with her child, and she told them to come and take her place on the Titanic that day, and and the woman and child were saved, and Edith Evans lost her life with four other first-class passengers. You see, I think a true champion is one that does the right thing despite your fears. If some of you have read the book of Esther and remember the story of Esther, she shows great courage through her fear when she has to approach King Xerxes, and no one in those days would ever approach uh, the king, especially King Xerxes. And she says to everyone, if I perish, I perish. Her faith and her trust in God saved her. One thing I think that we, we all need to fear in this lifetime is alienation from God. To leave this earth not knowing who our Savior is. In this story, David saves his people from a physical death, but it's Jesus who saves us from a spiritual death. I want to ask each and every one of you today, 
When was that time in your life that you put that fear of death aside? When did you assure your eternity in heaven? How many of you have been going through life kind of like Goliath with the belief that you don't need anything but your own abilities? I know I went through that same exact thing for 32 years of my life. I thought if I needed something, I just had to work a little bit harder so I could get it. I thought that I could find my own happiness through wealth, through popularity, through acceptance, only understanding that and knowing that none of those things were going to get me to where I needed to be. I had a a big void in my heart that I couldn't fill by myself. And it took me 32 years of my life to figure that out. We're only able to reach the life that God wants for us if we first surrender it. We must deny ourselves and ask Christ for help. I'm gonna ask each of you right now just to bow your heads with me. And I want you to think about that time in your life. Think about that time in your life that you surrendered your heart to God. Some of you remember it like it was yesterday. I remember it super clearly. And you may not know all the details, but you should have a pretty good idea of when that was in your life that you asked Christ to come into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. You repented of your sins. You figured out, I can't do this on my own anymore. I've got to stop running. I need God in my life. When was that time and when was that day for you? You know, I believe today that there are many that the Holy Spirit is working on right now. Christ wants to help you through those fears. He wants to walk with you through your struggling relationships, your son or daughter that's lost and struggling, your bills that you don't know how they're gonna get paid your battle with lust, your battle with addiction that you can't seem to overcome. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. You see, God knows your fears. He knows your struggles. And he's just waiting to step in and take it off your back and put it on his own. Think about that time in your life. If you can't recall a time that you asked Christ into your heart, that you said that prayer. The Bible is very clear in John 3, 3. It says, unless a man is born again, he's not fit for the kingdom of God. What do you mean born again? There must be a time in your life that you ask Christ to come into your heart. It doesn't just happen. When was that time that you surrendered, that you asked Jesus into your heart? When did you get that assurance that you have an eternity in heaven? You know what, I have so many friends that say, you know what, I'm just not ready yet. And they put it off and they put it off. You know, the Bible is very clear. It says our time here on earth is like a mist. It's like a vapor. It's here one second and it's gone the next. When we compare our times here on earth to all of eternity, and eternity is way too long to be wrong. When was that time for you? Maybe you've been running for a long time, but this morning you feel something that you haven't felt. You feel that tugging on your heart. Let me tell you something. God's trying to talk to you right now. He's trying to get your attention. It's time to surrender. It's time to give in. Give God a chance in your life. See what God can do. I'm gonna count to three and when I get to three, if you can't recall that time in your life that you surrendered your heart to him, I just want you to slip your hand into the air and say, You know what, Ron, I don't really remember when that was, but I want to know. I want you to include me in that prayer today, but more importantly, God of heaven, 
hear my prayer today. I want to know that when I stand before you, that I'm going to be welcomed in to a real place called heaven for eternity. You know what? We're going to hear one of two things when we stand before the Lord. And we're all going to stand before the Lord one day. I feel so assured because of that simple prayer that I said that when, I, when my time comes and I'm standing before the Lord, I'm going to hear the words, welcome in my loyal and my faithful servant. And I've had so many friends that have died unexpectedly. And it's so sad when I have to think about the, the words that they heard because they hadn't submitted their lives to Christ. For I never knew you. And they're cast into a lake of a fire for all of eternity. We're all going to stand before God. What are you going to hear? When was that time? Where was that place for you? When I get to three, just slip your hand into the air. Say, include me in that prayer today. I want to know that I know that I know that I have eternity waiting for me. I'm out of time. I'm going to count now. When I get to three... Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. This is between you and God this morning. Today is the day of salvation. One, two, three. Slip your hand into the air. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hands up high. Praise the Lord. You can put your hands back down. I'm going to ask all of you that raised your hands to repeat this prayer after meet. And I'm going to ask all of the other people in this room right now, those of you watching online, to also repeat this with me. If you've said that prayer, you know that your eternity is secured. You've asked Christ in your heart. I'm going to ask you also to repeat these words with me. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, offering me salvation, for rising on the third day, proving that you are God. I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I repent of my sins. I turn my back on my past. And from this day forward, I will love you and I will serve you every day of my life. Dear Jesus, come into my heart, be my Lord, and be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap this morning. The Bible tells us that all the angels in heaven rejoice over one decision made. Can I tell you there was a lot more than one decision in this place this morning? There's a celebration going on in heaven right now. I say this all the time and I've had the opportunity to, to do altar responses like this for the last 25 years. And it's so neat every single time that I see a hand shoot up into the air, someone asking Jesus into their hearts for the very first time, I still get goosebumps. There's no greater decision that can be made. It's the most amazing miracle ever performed is our own salvation. But you know what, I, I wanna do one more thing this morning. I remember when I said that prayer, I was sitting in a room full of 500 people, all knew me, all knew my past, all knew what I'd done, knew where I'd been. And the pastor said, if you said that prayer for the first time, I want you to do one more thing. I want you to come forward. And I'm gonna count to three again one more time. You guys say, why wow, you count to three a lot. It's as high as I can count. When I get to three to the next time, I'm gonna ask all of you that, that said that prayer for the first time, asking Christ into your heart, 
It doesn't matter where you're sitting this morning. I want to ask you just to step out and to walk up to this altar. We're just gonna pray for you. I'm gonna pray a a blessing over your life. And can I tell you something? That morning when I said that prayer for the first time and I made that walk up to the front of that altar, I felt like the weight of the world was lifted off of my shoulders. And I say this all the time, but if you can't take 15 steps in a place like this where people are just going to love on you and celebrate with you and congratulate you on the best decision you've ever made in your life, you won't make it 15 minutes out there in the real world where you can be persecuted for your faith. Make that walk. And you know what? As soon as I said that, the enemy starts to beat on you and say, you know what? You didn't really mean it. No way can you stand up and walk to the front. You know what, when I said that prayer for the first time, there was nothing that was gonna hold me in that seat. And as soon as I was given that opportunity, I walked up to the front of that altar and a team of wild horses couldn't have held me back. Don't give the devil a stronghold in your life. If you said that prayer, I want you to come forward. But I also wanna open this up to those of you that maybe you've said that prayer before, but this morning you're recommitting your life. God still spoke to you this morning and he's pulling on your heart. He's saying, you know what, I need to go forward. I need to, I need that blessing. Let us pray for you. Don't stay in your seat. Don't give the devil a stronghold. Maybe you just need prayer this morning. Maybe you're going through something that you need us to pray for you over. I also want you to join us. When I get to three, I'm going to have all of you come forward. I want the rest of the congregation to applaud louder than you have all morning long. One, two, three. Come on, church. Here we go. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on, church. Come on, church. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to have all of you just turn up here and face me. You can stay up here. We're going to play another song to finish out the service. Look right up here at me. Say, tonight's not the end. Today is only the beginning. God has a great plan for my life. Point to yourself, say, for my life. We are so excited about this decision. I'm going to pray a blessing over you. I want you to stay up here. Just give us a little bit of information. You know who we are. We want to know who you are. We want to be able to follow up and to continue to pray for each and every one of you that came forward this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these that responded to your word this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for their obedience, for their calling. And we're so excited, Lord, to see what you have planned for their lives. I know that there is so much more than we can even fathom that you have planned for each and every one of those that made that decision for the first time, for those that are recommitting their lives. And we pray for your presence over those that just need prayer this morning. Lord, we pray for your comfort, your peace. Jesus, thank you so much. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stay up here as long as you need. Prayer partners are down here in front. God bless you.